In the early 1980s, the arcade scene was still considered the wild, wild west of game design. A lot of game concepts were just being born and others were getting redefined and revolutionized. One such game is the classic Capcom arcade hit Commando. It took the basic military theme and added some intense, addictive gameplay into the mix. Why did the arcade game have three different names? So reload your weapon and let's kill some bad guys because this is the history of Commando. The year is 1985 and legendary Capcom designer Takuro Fujiwara is busy designing not one, but two classic arcade games. The first game he was working on to be released that same year was a little known game called Ghosts and Goblins. The other one was the classic overhead run and gun game Commando. There were overhead games released before, most notably Taito's Frontline, which was released in 1982. At the time, one man army movies were starting to become popular, especially in the USA with the likes of Chuck Norris in Missing in Action and Sylvester Stallone as Rambo in First Blood. Mr. Fujiwara recognized this and wanted to capitalize on its popularity. Although the game was called Commando here in the States, in Japan it was called Senjao no Ukame, or translated as Wolf of the Battlefield. In the summer of 1985, the Arnold Schwarzenegger Kill Fest Commando was released and was an instant classic. I have not been able to find any concrete proof that the name of the game was changed to appeal to fans of the movie, but if I had to guess, I would say it's almost a certainty. Commando was released in 1985 by Capcom. You take on the role of Super Joe, a generic soldier who is an army of one waging war against the forces of evil. Now even though Super Joe was dressed in World War II fatigues, you are dropped off in the jungle by helicopter, suggesting the setting could be Vietnam. Since this was the game that redefined the run and gun shooter, the game is not very advanced in terms of power ups or vehicles. Your primary weapon is your machine gun, which thankfully has unlimited ammo and your secondary weapon is a limited supply of grenades. Now even though there are no weapon upgrades for your machine gun, it still packs a wallop. The grenades are useful for not only wiping out the enemy soldiers, but for areas your machine gun just can't reach, such as trenches and overpasses. The action is fast and furious, with the difficulty getting pretty hard pretty quick. The game takes place across 8 levels, with each level divided into 2 subsections. Your main goal is just to get to the end of the level while killing everything in sight. Occasionally you will have to rescue a POW or two, so be on the lookout for them. At the end of each stage, instead of a boss fight, you have to kill a multitude of enemies. Once this is complete, you move on to the next stage. In between each stage, you are treated to a nice cutscene of your soldier either eating rations, cleaning his weapon, or enjoying a nice big drag off his cigarette. I was 12 years old when I first played this game, and when I saw Super Joe having a super puff, it started me on a path to my five pack a day habit. Here is a recent picture of me doing what I do best. If you manage to complete all eight stages, you are treated to a very brief ending screen and the game starts over. The game underwent a few modifications when it was released in Germany. At the time, the country was very sensitive to games depicting humans killing other humans. All of the soldiers you face are now silver robots and the name was changed to Space Invasion. This is similar to what Konami did with the Contra series when it was released in that country. In 1990, the sequel was released in the arcades. Known as Mercs here in the States, it features simultaneous three-player action. Using the same vantage point as its predecessor, everything in the game has been dialed up to 11. Instead of just traversing up the screen, the screen actually scrolls left and right giving you a wider play area. This time around, your team is known as the Wolf Force as you set out to rescue a former president who has been kidnapped by rebels in the fictional country of Zutula. 
The game takes place across six levels and plays very similar to the original game. There is one major change though and that is the addition of a life bar which makes the game just a tad bit easier. However, what Capcom giveth, Capcom taketh away. Instead of three lives this time around, you only get one. There were also various weapon pickups including a flamethrower, grenade launcher, assault rifle, and a shotgun. There is also a mega crush attack power up which kills everything on the screen. Certain stages even allow vehicles to be driven. In 2008, Wolf of the Battlefield Commando 3 was released on the PlayStation Network and Xbox Live. Super Joe was apparently retired and a brand new team of soldiers have been assembled. Similar to Mercs, the game offers three players simultaneous action with vastly improved visuals and audio. The gameplay is very similar to the previous two games which is definitely not a bad thing. A nice addition for novice players is the addition of four difficulty levels. I enjoyed playing it when it first came out, especially in multiplayer, and still is a lot of fun to play to this day. Unfortunately, it only got average reviews when it was released. It's currently available for $5 on the PlayStation Network. In the game Speed Rumbler, the main character's name was changed to Super Joe for the US release. The same thing happened when Bionic Commando was released here in the States, with the main character's name being changed. Both Commando and Mercs were included as part of Capcom's Classic Collection which was released for PlayStation 2 and Xbox. In 1986, Elite Software took a huge gamble and bet the company on the license for Commando. According to one of the programmers for the company, they agreed to pay Capcom £65,000 up front for the home computer rights, outbidding both US Gold and Ocean Software in the process. The gamble paid off and the game was a huge success across a multitude of home computers. The first version we are looking at is the Atari 2600 conversion. This was actually released by Activision and just by looking at it, I couldn't tell it was Commando. This was also from the same company that thought Double Dragon would be a good idea for the 2600. This looks like Indiana Jones with the sparse desert backgrounds and only two enemies on screen at once. To be fair, the game is fast and controls reasonably well, even with only one fire button. I guess if you played the 800 or so other Atari 2600 titles, you could always check this one out. Let's stick with the Atari line and look at the 7800 version. This is really well done with nice detailed sprites and fast frantic gameplay. One change from the arcade game is the ability to pick up different weapons such as a flamethrower and an upgraded machine gun. Launching grenades is no longer a problem thanks to the second fire button on the 7800 controller. There is even a pretty good rendition of the arcade theme playing in the background. Well done. Up next is the Commodore 16 version. If you've never had any experience with this system and thought the Commodore 64 was just way too powerful, then this system was right up your alley. Upon first glance after booting up this game, I thought I was playing Whack-A-Mole. The screen no longer scrolls and you have to clear each section of soldiers before you can move on to the next. There is no music and only rudimentary sounds. Moving right up the food chain with the Commodore 64, we have another excellent version. The music especially is a highlight with it being done by Rob Hubbard. The game is fast and furious with nice detailed sprites and excellent background. The controls are nice and tight, but unfortunately there is only one fire button. One thing that lets the game down is that there are only three levels as opposed to the eight in the arcade game. However, 
In 2014, Commodore Group Nostalgia released an updated version of this game which put back all of the missing levels. It also included the missing helicopter animations at the beginning and a multitude of other things including the option of playing with updated music and sound effects or the original. The home version most people are familiar with is the NES version. This was an early title for the system and unfortunately it really shows. This was programmed by Micronix and it's just not very good. They try to jam way too many sprites on screen at once and what we're left with is a glitchy flickering mess. The level design from the arcade has also been changed completely. There are now twice as many levels in this version as opposed to the arcade game as well as extra power-ups and bulletproof vests. At least this time around we have a second fire button for the grenades. Let's take a look at the 16-bit Amiga version and it is absolutely fantastic. The graphics are very close to the arcade game and the scrolling is nice and smooth. The sound effects are really good with excellent sampled sounds straight from the arcade game. Everything from the original has been included from the helicopter to the cutscenes. The only downside in this version would have to be the lack of a second fire button for your grenades. Otherwise, it is really well done and one of the best conversions on the Amiga. The Atari ST port, aside from a loss of color, is pretty much the same as the Amiga version. Moving back on down to the 8 bits is the Apple II version. The first thing you notice is how compact the play area is, making everything feel cramped and claustrophobic. The speed of the game is decent and it controls pretty well. The audio is virtually non existent except for a few farts here and there. The Amstrad port is up next and as far as graphics go it looks pretty good. Everything has been shrunk down and the backgrounds are very sparse but the speed of the game is close to the arcade original. We do get an excellent rendition of the theme song while we play. Moving right along and not quite quick enough if you ask me is the MSX version. The bad versions just keep on getting worse. If bright flickering lights and seizures are your thing then be sure and give this version a try. I don't know what in the world they were thinking trying to release something this bad. The scrolling is a jittery mess and all of your enemies look like stormtroopers. The speed is decent and there is music while you play but that doesn't make up for the abysmal controls and overall presentation. When it was released back in 1986, the Spectrum version received high praise, but honestly I am just not seeing what the appeal was. Yes the gameplay is smooth and it moves along at a brisk pace. But similar to the Amstrad version, the backgrounds are sparse and not very detailed. There is a nice rendition of the theme song playing while you play, which is always a plus, but in my opinion, it's just not very good. How about the Intellivision version? Boy oh boy, I don't know what I'm looking at, but it surely can't be Commando. We have green as far as the eye can see. Despite the horrible and television disc controllers, the game still plays fairly decent. The characters are nicely animated, but they move along slower than molasses. On a positive note, there is a good rendition of the theme song. Now 
let's close out the conversions with one of the worst ever, and that would have to be the MS-DOS version. Not only do we get a nice thick bezel on each side of the screen, but we get a smaller compacted play area. It reminds me of the old days of Doom, where you could make the screen smaller to make the game run faster. Beautifully ugly pastel colors along with semi-smooth scrolling makes this one for the ages. Since it's an early DOS game, the only sound we get is coming from the PC speaker, and it is absolutely atrocious, so have your earplugs handy. I think I would rather listen to my wife talk for five minutes than listen to this game. At least the gameplay is fast, but that's not saying much. Commando was a revolutionary run-and-gun game which set the template for many future titles. While the game is a bit short and a bit limited, what it does, it does well. Although it's not the first game in the genre, it certainly made its mark and is fondly remembered to this day. If you've never checked out this game, give it a go. You'll be glad you did. If you would like to support me on Patreon, please click the link below. Also, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to my content. It's the only way my little channel can grow. Thank you so much for watching.